Um, good morning. It's truly an honor to be with you today. Uh, thanks for the board of GIS for the invitation and the best of luck for a successful meeting. Now, high thrombus burden in acute coronary syndrome is still a major challenge for all of us. What is high thrombus burden? Is there, is there a definition for it? Well, yes, there is. When you look at the thrombus burden and its classification, which is showing here for you, if, if you have a grade of thrombus burden up three or above, that's a heavy thrombus burden. How do we do that? It depends whether you have a thrombus or not. It depends on the size of the vessel. So if you have a definite thrombus present in a vessel which is 0.5 to 2 or vessel diameter and, uh, and above, you will have a 3 plus uh, 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 mark uh, 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 score. Now, total occlusion, which we encounter a lot in acute coronary syndrome, it does not by itself mean that you have a high thrombus load. You might have a total occlusion, yet just about 50% of them do not have a high thrombus load. Let me start by first case. A 56-year-old male, obese with a BMI of 38, ex-heavy smoker, non-diabetic, presenting to the ER with severe ongoing substantial chest pain, starting one hour prior to ER arrival. Initial high sensitivity troponin is a borderline positive, and the echo showed a good LV function with no, without regional wall motion abnormality. This is the initial ECG. You can appreciate that there is some ST elevation in the inferior lead. It's not remarkable, but it's there. So it's an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Radial approach, I usually use an ICARI uh, guide from the start rather than having diagnostic then go to a guide. This is the lift system. There is a good uh, large ectasia in the LED. The circuit is relatively small. And there is no stenosis in, the, in, that, uh, in the lift uh, system. When you look at the right side, if you're wondering what's, what's here, he had a bariatric surgery in the past. Now, that's, it shows here that there is a large ectasia in the right coronary artery, which you can appreciate. The posterior lateral, look at this, a huge thrombus sitting there, but the timi flow is not bad. It's, a, it, 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 it's, it's more than two. So at this point, I was in the cat lab. The patient was stable. No more chest pain. On the monitor, the ST elevation abated. It's not there anymore. So what was in my mind at the time? Should I do aspiration thrombectomy? If I have IV cangulo, should I use it? I see fibrinolysis as of a questionable uh, evidence base in, in, in these cases. Should I use G2B3A with an IC or IV? Should I proceed with PCI, though I know deep in my heart that there should be there probably an increased high uh, incidence of no reflow or sl slow flow. Or go with CCU monitoring on dual antiplatelets, G2B3A and low molecular weight heparin. And that's what I elected to do because the patient is stable. Uh, several hours in the CCU while on the triple regimen, he complained of chest pain and here he got a real ST elevation in the inferior and lateral leaf. That's three hours after the cath was done. So, in my thinking, it, it, my explanation was because the heparin bolus I gave was wearing off, so I rebolused him with heparin, put him on IV nitroglycerin, and that cooled him off and made me wait. 48 hours later, to radial approach again, this is a guide in the right coronary, after DAPT, enoxaparin, and tyrofepan for 48 hours. I came in and I found that there is still a th huge thrombus burden sitting in the posterior lateral here. You, you can see it. There might be a high-grade stenosis distal to it, but the flow is not bad. So what should I do? The patient's stable. Should I leave it alone? Well, I put a couple of wires, did the aspiration thrombectomy. The guide was not seated well initially, but I made it get seated well. So I did aspiration thrombectomy several times. How much did that hap happen to, to help me? Well, I got no reflow immediately. So what did I do? I put a microcatheter, put uh, and through the microcatheter, high doses of adenosine, nitroglycerin, what have you, nothing worked. So here you see the tachycardia happening. You probably know what I did. 
I gave him a soda microcatheter, uh, adrenaline, epinephrine, uh, 50 mics increment up to 500. He got tachycardic, but lucky enough, look at this, the flow wa was better. The thrombus burden, maybe it's a bit less. I did multiple angioplasties at the time, decided not to stent it. So I did not stent it, and I left it like this. The patient was very stable, and I thought I better off just leave him like that at that particular point. So I did an LV gram, and to my good surprise, the ventricle is actually hyperdynamic in a way. So how did he do in the hospital? He remained stable. Toponin peaked at 12,900 and CPK at 800. He was discharged on clopidogrel, bioxobam, aspirin, bisopolo, lucifer, He remained very stable on follow-up. Rivaroxobam part, um, it's up for, de for debate. I'm sure we can talk about that. One year later, I did the CCTA, so the CTA coronary angiogram. And you can appreciate that the angioplasty and all what I did showed a sustained result here, which is really good. Now, the second case, that was an ST elevation myocardial infarction. This is a 37-year-old male, heavy smoker and obese, with positive family history of free premature ASCVD. He presented with a stuttering chest pains with non-specific EKG changes. High sensitivity troponin was positive, so I treated him like an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Next day, this is the angiogram. The left system does not have significant uh, disease, and you can appreciate a large dominant right filling via collaterals from the left system. This is how the right looks like. Total occlusion, and again, with what I said before, the total occlusion is not synonymous with high thrombus burden, but in this case it was. As, as you all know, just passing the wire through gave me some little flow. I put the balloon and massaged it, gave me more flow, and I passed uh, aspiration so back to me several times. We would expect that you will get better flow, but I'm sorry to tell you, I did not. So the, it, it, it became totally occluded again. So at that time, I looked at the angiogram you can appreciate that it's almost to me two flow plus, so I decided to stent it. That's, de that's of debate, of course. So I stented that. This is my first stent put in. And this is how it looks like after the stent. You can appreciate the large thrombus burden proximal to the stent cell. Did it work? Well, not that much. So it, it abruptly occluded, occluded again. The ACT at the time was above 300. G2B3A was running. So what did I do? I gave him tons of adenosine. I gave him tons of nitroglycerin. Did a lot of angioplasty and uh, with up to 5O balloon. And that's what I got. So there was a still a residual large thrombus in the proximal segment. I decided to put another stent. This is the second stent. But look what I got in the middle here. And I didn't know what, what in the world is this. Is this a, an invagination of tissue through the stent trust or it's a residual thrombus? I had no answer. And unfortunately, I did not have IVES at the time in the cath lab. So I didn't have imaging to do. So I looked at it again. It's still there, ugly looking in the middle. So what, I did, what did I decide? Again, the patient is stable. So why fiddle more with it? So I left him alone. The flow is great, Timmy is excellent, but that thing that do, does not make me feel comfortable. So 48 hours later, DAPT and oxaprim tyrofibran was given, brought him back in and looked at the, the right coronary artery. You can see in the middle there that the area which I don't like, and I'm sure you don't like, is still there. So I, again, I thought, what would it be? If it's a thrombus, what should I do? If it's an invagination what, of tissue in the strut. So I decided just to put a simply another stent in. And that's what I did. I put another stent in, and I looked in it, and it looks like a perfect angiogram. After the PCI, the TIMI flow is three, and the myocardial blush grade was not bad either. So the patient remained stable and was discharged on ticagulol, aspirin, bisopolol, atorvastatin, and again, I put them in rivaroxaban. This is up for debate in terms of NOAC use in this particular subset of patients. 
So my colleagues, there is a potential advantage of deferred standing. We don't do it routinely because it's not supposed to be done routinely. The major disadvantage of deferred stenting is that the vessel might re-occlude on you. You might need urgent revascularization. But the major advantage is that you avoid no flow or, 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 and slow flow. On top of that, you actually you will get less stent of the lesion, and you will actually size the stent to a better reference diameter compared when you have a large thrombus burden. Most of us would agree this is a schema in terms of how to do it, that you probably with minimal intervention, mechanical intervention, just wire, balloon, aspiration, thrombectomy, or a combination of the above, if you, if you get TIMI or two or three flow in the patients, and the patients are stable, and there is a high thrombus burden, the lesion length is above 24, and there are higher screen features for slow flow, these, these patients are good candidates for deferred approach. Which, which lesions actually have a higher incidence of no, no reflow? The older the patients, the longer the lesion, and the, time, the, the length of time for perfusion, the late comers or the late reperfusion will give you uh, more no reflow. So what's my conclusion other than next time I need an intervascular imaging in the cat lab? Heavy thrombus burden is not uncommon during PCI for STEMI and non-STEMI. Deferred stenting does work in subset of patients, and there are actually randomized data to show us that there is an improved left ventricular function, better uh, flow in those patients, avoiding no reflow, and there are some data to show that MACE might be, might be better. Routine deferred stenting is not actually advisable. Just let me finish this couple of seconds. Um, it's not advisable. Cases with high thrombus burden, especially in longer lesions and high risk features for, for slow flow are the best candidates. Probably up for debate. When should I do the deferred stenting? When should I bring the patient back in? In the randomized trial, which, which, which I looked at, the time elapsing in those trials was 24 to 72 hours. However, there are data to show that up to five to seven days is still safe and can be done. Now the role of DOAX or NOAX plus DABT is up for debate in those patients. Thank you very much. Thank you.